Thanks for joining us. I'm Jenny Splitter. I'm a freelance journalist and senior contributor to Forbes for the food and drink section there. Um, we're going to be talking about the future of alternative proteins today, and I'm joined by Saloni Shaw, who is a food and farming analyst at Breakthrough. Jason Lusk, who's a food and agriculture economist at Purdue University. And Allison Rabschnuck, I think I said it correctly, <laughs> who is Director of Corporate Engagement at the Good Food Institute. Um, so we're going to start off with Saloni, who's going to kind of give us an overview for the conversation and talk about the paper that she co-authored on uh, federal funding for uh, alternative proteins. So take it away, Saloni. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny, and I'm excited to be here with Jason and Allison as well. To give a general overview, we published a report highlighting the, um, how government investment can help advance the alternative protein sector, help stimulate economic re recovery, and also produce um, immense climate benefits. What we've been seeing with COVID-19, um, despite the recent surge in plant-based sales on the retail side, um, the pandemic has hampered the industry's production and R&D and food service sales. In response, we're saying that federal invest investment in terms of R&D spending and in terms of loan guarantees can help the sector expand production capacity and continue innovating so that they can bring products to market faster and bring costs down and to increase their market share within the plant protein and the cultivated meat or, or in the global meat market. Um, and this is important because a government investment can help chart the development of the sector in a way that helps to benefit society and help to benefit the environment and consumers um, versus private sector investment. Um, yep, that is a general overview. Okay, great. Um, and I also wanted to say that if you have questions, please add them now or th whenever, whenever they hit you throughout the chat and we will get to as many as we can. Um, so just to start out, uh, and I think you guys might all each have like a different uh, perspective on this. We kind of want to give people a, a sense of what plant-based sales are actually doing right now um, and how they've been impacted by COVID-19. I know there's this whopping 264% uh, uh, number out there, but how does that compare to, to regular meat? And, and, and give us some context. Um, Solani, do you want to start actually? Yes, definitely. To give some context to the growth rates, you're, you mentioned the 264% increase. In absolute numbers, that's around $26 million. Um, but at the same time, we've seen fresh meat retail sales increase by about 45%, which is more on the order of, I think, $30 billion. Um, alternative proteins are still the underdog here, and they make up 1% of total meat sales. Um, and although there is some impressive retail growth right now, also remember that food service, uh, food service outlets closing has impacted and decreased um, sales and revenues from that income stream for companies. Okay, Allison, did you want to add any, anything to that? How does GFI feel about uh, plant-based meat and milk sales right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to say also a quick thank you to the Breakthrough Institute for inviting me on this panel and for everybody who's listening in the audience. So yeah, I mean, at the Good Food Institute, we're very uh, bullish about the plant-based market and in fact, alternative proteins just as a whole. Um, leading up to the pandemic, we annually pull retail sales data from a company called Spins, um, which you can see on our website at gfi.org. And what we saw just looking at 2019 versus the prior year and year before that is that um, the plant-based foods market had grown 29% to $5 billion. That includes plant-based meat, eggs, dairy, so all of the products that replace animal products. Um, and yes, we did see you know, triple digit increases in, in various weeks during the pandemic um, and totally agree that this is still just a drop in the bucket, right? Uh, plant-based meat only makes up 1% of, of animal meat at retail. Um, however, I do think that the, the current crisis has really shown um, a lot of um, instability that's in the animal agriculture uh, industry. So it's, you know, number one, drawn consumers' attention to the public health risks of animal agriculture. Um, I think another thing is, is that many consumers who were first introduced to plant-based meat at one of the popular restaurant chains like Burger King or Dunkin' Donuts um, that did launch, you know, things like the Impossible and Beyond Burger, 
um, those people, those consumers are now trying to find those same products in retail. Um, and then I think also because of animal meat shortages in grocery stores, it's also likely driven more first time trial, which has allowed consumers to realize just how good today's plant based products are. Um, and the other thing I think to remember is that there, there, you know, again, this is a small market, but there have been so many new entrants and we haven't even seen the bulk of them yet. There were a whole bunch of brands that were supposed to be coming to market in February and March that couldn't because of COVID. Uh, JBS, right, one of the world's largest meat companies, was about to launch a plant-based brand called Ozo. Kellogg's was about to launch a plant-based brand called Incognito. Hormel with Happy Little Plants. So we really feel like this is just the beginning. And, you know, over the next year and, and further, we're going to see this sector explode even further. Jason, do you uh, have a different perspective on that or anything else you want to add? Kind of a future plant-based meat right now? Yeah, I'll just comment on a couple aspects. One, it, it's already piggybacking on what Saloni and Allison said, but it's kind of trivial, but you know, if you sp start from a small base, you're gonna have a large percentage increase. And, and I think that's in large part what, we, what we've seen. You know, for some of our conventional meat products in that initial spike that happened, uh, right when we had the shutdown of food away from home and the run on groceries, you saw conventional meat product sales increased by about 100% too. So I think, you know, whether uh, an alternative protein fared well or not during this pandemic probably depends on their exposure to food at home versus food away from home. And we know different companies were positioned differently in relative to those two markets. So if you were, you were positioned to mainly have sales through grocery, you were pretty well, you, you know, you, you, you're well positioned <laughs> to capitalize on this, you know, situation. If your market was instead, you know, more focused on food service, food away from home, you probably didn't fare so well. Uh, and that's just an accident of the way the pandemic played out. Um, and so I think that's sort of an important aspect to this as well. I, I do think the thing Allison mentioned is really important. There, there are two, two kind of countervailing trends. I think one was, yes, I think there were a number of consumers that tried plant-based alternatives for the first time because there were some shortages at different spots. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that plays out over the next few months if you get some repeat business. The other aspect of that too, though, is that uh, I think, you know, the alternate is that people, for whatever reason, the psychology of consumers was that they, they tended to return to familiar things and familiar brand names. I think one of the surprising things for me was in that initial stockout period is that the, the conventional meat items were gone. Um, it's not the thing I would have first predicted people would have bought during a pandemic. It's fresh. Um, it's relatively more expensive, uh, but yet it was something people returned to. And, and again, people went to familiar brand names um, opposed to, as opposed to new startups. Now, some of that was because grocery stores stopped stocking new items. Uh, so it's hard to know what the cause, the, the, the direction of the causation is there. To um, jump in and add to what Jason was saying about um, whether or not how, how dependent companies are on food service versus retail, Many um, plant-based and alternative protein companies are, are dependent on food service. It's, it's, there's a lower barrier of entry. You can educate consumers. Um, so in light of the pandemic, companies had to shift their strategies to retail, which they hadn't been planning on doing maybe right now. Um, and grocery stores were struggling to handle new inventory. They had to focus on handling the current inventory that they had. So it takes a little bit of time to uh, provide space on the shelves for these new products. And to add to your point about um, meat products being fresh, the, I think, advantage that some consumers start to see with plant-based products is that they have a longer shelf life, um, which, is, which is great if they want to reduce their um, shopping, grocery shopping trips. Um, and in terms of uh, the meat costs going up in grocery stores, um, the, the aspect of whether or not this is going to lead to dietary shifts after you know, consumers find themselves trying these products for the first time due to the public health and economic um, downturn of these crises, it's, it's going to depend a lot on costs. And we've seen that Beyond um, actually reduced the cost of some of their products. And that, I think, helps to uh, motivate shoppers to um, try these products out and, and maybe even uh, have them be a part of their routine. So the future success, I think, of these companies will depend on whether they can convert, the, uh, convert a lot of consumers during this temporary shortfall um, that the livestock producers are, are um, experiencing. 
we'll have to see how well they can milk this opportunity. It's interesting because we were already, as somebody who covers these products, we're already trying to figure out, is this a trend that's here to stay? And so now sort of trying to figure it out with coronavirus is just like this extra challenge on top of everything. Um, so to shift to production, um, and there's so much to say on this topic as somebody who's been covering kind of meat plant closures a little bit and uh, trying to figure out plant-based production because it is such a new industry and, and sort of what's going on with those facilities. A lot of companies, I think, were just starting to build facilities around this time. I mean, there's so much variation, you know, within the plant-based industry. But so what is overall kind of like, what's been the impact of the coronavirus on uh, plant-based production? Um, how's it impacting facilities? Uh, and it, I guess anyone can take that. Um, do you want to go start with Jason? Maybe if you if you have anything to say. <laughs> sure. I mean, I you know my familiarity with um, is is much stronger on the the livestock side of things. And I, I should say to the listeners, in, in terms of full disclosure, I you know I have done consulting work for you know some of the conventional you know livestock industries and meat industries, you know, and at the worst, um, late April mid. Uh, early May, they were running at about 40% below production of the pre from the previous year. Now we're almost completely recovered from that. Um, but you saw some really, you know, back to Saloni's point, some really significant price increases at the wholesale level uh, in May, um, really, you know, unprecedented, and they've sort of come back down. So, you know, on the plant-based side, I don't have any intimate uh, detailed knowledge there. Maybe Allison can help us out. But one thing I will say is no food company is immune from uh, potential shocks from their suppliers. And, um, you know, and there were a few stories that came out about, some, you know, some products that had, you know, Chinese based suppliers. I don't know that it caused any shortages, but, you know, every, every, in these pandemic times, everybody's got to pay attention and be, you know, be cognizant of those things. I think, you know, in a human spread pandemic, the real challenge has been where are the areas where there's a lot of labor density. And that's one of the reasons that meat production facilities, packers, have, were so affected. You had a large amount of labor in a really small, confined, refrigerated uh, environment. And, um, you know, that, that's going to, I suspect, cause them to want to automate a lot more. And, you know, if the production environments of some of these alternative proteins, they probably don't require nearly as much labor. Most of that labor in meat plants is involved in what you might call disassembly, um, further breaking down a carcass. And, and so the fact that they're you know, it's just a different production process means that the labor density some, looks something um, less pronounced and therefore as a result is less exposed to that particular kind of shock. Allison, did you want to add to this? Yeah, yeah, I, I think Jason's uh, absolutely right in that the, the plant-based production facilities are just completely different. They typically require far fewer people um, and they're, the processes are much more automated. You know, you're not having employees standing inches apart like, like in a slaughterhouse. So I think that's why we have actually not really heard of many impacts on plant-based production because of worker infections. Um, or even supply chain sourcing challenges um, from what, again, what we've heard. So um, I do know that, you know, companies like Impossible Foods uh, did actually increase its retail distribution in May from like literally almost doubled the number of stores they were in from 2,700 to over 4,000. Um, also heard from the company Just that makes the liquid plant-based egg product um, that they uh, saw an increase in May of 78% more and more bottles. Um, and they've reported no incidents due to um, COVID uh, as far as slowdowns go. So I think that the, the supply chain for uh, the plant-based products, it's, it's just much easier to turn on and off. So it's, it's, you know, it has the ability to be much more responsive um, when things like this happen. So um, yeah, and I think that you know, what we have seen is that some of the brands have absolutely had to pivot from food service. Um, you know, companies like Rebellious Foods, which is a startup out of Seattle that makes plant-based chicken, low-cost plant-based chicken nuggets, they had a 100% 100 food service strategy until COVID hit. Um, and they very quickly were able to pivot, which is not an easy thing, uh, but they were able to do so. And now they are going to be selling in retail um, in the Pacific Northwest to start. So, so that's about it. Allison, can I ask a question from what you've heard? Uh, one of the things you know I've heard from a variety of food retailers is it seems pretty 
simple, right? If food, uh, if restaurants are closed down, can't you just move the food over to grocery stores, but a big constraint I know for a lot of food companies has been in packaging, uh, you know, egg producers faces. It just weren't enough cartons because that's not the way we send, the way we send eggs to grocery stores, not the, the way we send egg, uh, eggs to, to food, uh, food service. But have you heard of those kinds of things? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I know a couple companies that have had to pivot like that, and I would I would say not many of them actually have products in grocery stores yet. I think it's still to come over the next couple months. Um, but yes, they've had to very quickly come up with packaging. If they didn't already have retail packaging, they've had to potentially adjust the carton sizes, right, from food service to retail, even the kinds of products that they were selling. So uh, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of scrambling behind the scenes by a lot of these companies, yeah. for sure. And to the degree to which this impacts smaller or bigger producers, um, smaller players in the sector may be more nimble and be able to kind of shift their supply. But, uh, you know, I've seen with Impossible, they had some issues with, um, you know, getting some of their labeling approved. Um, based on some interviews and anecdotal evidence, I, I did hear of some couple plant-based facilities temporary closing in light of the pandemic and a few facilities where um, production R&D has been slowed in response, but your point is correct that um, due to the nature of production, it's automated and mechanized, it may be um, easier to mitigate some of these risks. Um, and, and going to the future with, with production, um, the, this sector has the advantage of potentially having a very geographically dispersed production network, which can maybe um, help them be uh, more resilient to these, to these shocks. I should also mention um, that, you know, there's been some, I'm not sure about full closures, maybe just partial closures, like in, mm -hmm. in fruit and vegetable packing houses and not plant-based protein companies, but I know there was like a baked goods company. So it is, it is, you know, a human spread virus. And so mm -hmm. that's really what the issue is. It just seems to be less um, than in meat because of the sort of tight working conditions. You mentioned R&D, Selene, and I did want to kind of ask about that and how that's been impacted um, by COVID-19, especially since I think this might be a good time to talk about cultured meat a little bit since uh, there's so much more research that needs to go into it. It's not on the market yet for anybody who's watching this who might be thinking they can go pick up lab meat or that Impossible Burgers are lab meat or cultured meat, as you're supposed to say. It's not. <laughs> but tell us about kind of the, the R&D aspect and how that's been impacted. Right. Just to give some context first, um, pre-COVID and in general, especially for the cultivated meat space, there are so many basic, fundamental, just foundational research questions that, that need to be asked and answered. Um, that are pre-competitive, if these questions can be answered, if, if you know, stable, um, agriculturally relevant um, cell lines can be developed, um, if, you know, more uh, advanced bioreactor designs can be developed, if we can create um, cell culture that's relevant for food production and, and that's cheaper and has ingredients um, uh, that are easier to procure, um, that are designed for more biomedical applications, um, there will be benefits across the industry for all companies involved. Um, and that's why we've been investing, or we've been um, really emphasizing government investment. In terms of what has happened in light of the pandemic, um, obviously because of social distancing, researchers are going to be facing restricted access to laboratories. University research has been impacted. A lot of cultivated research happens at that level. Um, and you'll see uh, startups and companies, they've had to push back some of their R&D milestones. They can't burn through their cash as fast as they did before because of the pandemic. And once their R&D milestones have been delayed, they'll have to talk to maybe their, their VC uh, partners, partners about that, that could impact um, potential milestones. You've also seen um, restricted restrictions in um, research equipment as well. So um, it, it does have a big impact because once research is pushed back, it's, it's harder to bring these products to market. And a lot of, I wonder if their timelines have been, have been pushed back because of that. Um, does that speak to your question? 
I think you're in need. I had too many windows moving around. Uh, just playing like games. I was on Twitter. Don't sorry about that. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> yes, that does answer my question. Um, but I wonder if Allison has anything to add. I know GFI is a major funder of culture meat companies and has been really involved with that research. So yeah, how do you see the that how COVID nineteen has been impacting sure. the R D side? Yeah, and just to clarify, we don't actually fund companies. Um, we, we, we will fund researchers, um, but yeah, not sorry, sorry. Research. No, no worries. Um, yeah, I think I think absolutely the the impact on the cultivated meat startups is really just restricted access to their laboratories. But I think they have the benefit of still mostly being pretty small companies, right? There are over 60 companies worldwide um, that are working on cultivated meat, whether it's uh, B2C or B2B. And so most of them did have some restrictions and yes, yeah, some lab equipment I think was probably harder to get due to COVID. But I don't think R&D has stopped and I don't think it's even stopped on the plant-based side. You know, from, I know Matson, the, the food innovation company out of the Bay Area did a, a survey a couple months ago um, asking a few hundred food and beverage professionals, not just in plant-based and in, in all kinds of food companies, um, you know, how COVID had impacted their R&D and most of them, I think over 65% said that they were still working on new concepts and products. I think the big impact is just going to be on, on the plant-based side that product launches are just going to be delayed. So, and it could be by a year or two, uh, mostly because retailers you know, aren't considering category resets during this time. They're still just trying to make sure that they have enough inventory of, of food on the shelves. So I think they're maybe thinking just a little bit farther um, ahead than they normally would have. But you know, there are a lot of startups right now on the plant-based side um, who are experimenting with things like 3D, 3D printing, shear cell technology, solid state fermentation. And I think um, that R&D is, is still moving along and we'll hopefully see the, the fruits of that research in the next couple of years. Okay, I'm seeing. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, if you wanted to add. Something. No, I was just going to say, as somebody who works at a major research uh, university, I can tell you, yes, research has slowed down. I, I, uh, good grief, I can't tell you how many webinars, Zoom calls I've been on, and trying to get research restarted. But you know, certainly it's to to such an extent that um, you know, assistant professors can push their tenure clock back by a year because of, of the recognition for how much research has been has been pushed pushed off and pushed behind. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, we're not the same as a private company doing research, but to that point about the kind of foundational research to the extent we're putting out that kind of stuff, yes, it's being slowed down. Uh, one thing I thought I would just notice, you know, hopefully I'm not stepping on the toes of a future question, Jenny, but um, is, you know, there are, there are several government agencies that fund work in this space. Um, and, and I say that in part because I've been on grants uh, that, that involve a little bit in the space. It, you, USDA, NIFA explains, uh, funds some, you know, small business research uh, uh, initiative, um, NSF. Actually, one of the things I guess we did as research labs were shut down is with some colleagues in engineering, we put forward a proposal for NSF, so we had a little more time to write some research grants. Um, so there, you know, there is funding that's out there. Um, it's awfully competitive. Um, and of course, all of us would like more money for our areas of research. Well, that kind of leads me into the next area anyway. So, that's so I did step on your toes. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I wanted that to sound positive, but I think that was my mom voice coming out. Like, oh, this is my next question. No, <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't. We were going to talk about a little bit about VC funding and where that's at, but also it just more mostly to kind of set the stage of like where, what, what, what are sort of like the reasonable expectations of government funding um, in the plant-based sector. So yeah, I guess just to start with what, how has sort of venture capital funding been impacted by COVID-19? And, you know, uh, is it kind of rebounding? Um, how is the vegan mafia doing? I just wanted to say vegan mafia, my favorite phrase. Um, but yeah, I, like, I want to know kind of what private investment looks like as just a starting point, And then we can um, get into maybe uh, what the government investment might look like. And I see lots of questions on the sites. So we'll try to get all of those soon too. Um, yeah, maybe, well, actually, Allison, do you want to start maybe with just some of the VC funding landscape? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think despite a reduction in valuations and obviously a real increased scrutiny and due diligence um, as a result of the economic instability that's happening right now, 
uh, we think that most of the plant-based food companies should have adequate capital to fuel their continued growth, although there will absolutely be winners and losers, um, just like at any other time. Um, but I also think that what really helped was that some of the active venture capital companies, especially the impact investors in this space, um, had actually raised a lot of new funds in 2019, which means that there are hundreds of millions of dollars of investable, you know, what we call dry powder in the market. So we're hoping that, you know, some of that money can be used going forward. Um, we also expect that as a result of the historic Beyond Meat IPO, plant-based food sales growth, and, and other factors that we've talked about in today's presentation, um, that investment in plant-based food will become increasingly mainstream, um, albeit, you know, it is still very nascent. I mean, we, we, we recognize that. It's a, it's a fraction of, of other industries. Um, and I think that, you know, in cultivated meat, we're going to see the same thing. I mean, obviously it's a much newer market than, than plant-based, but if you look at just first quarter 2020, so kind of just as the pandemic was happening, cultivated meat startups brought in almost as much funding as they previously had in the whole history of the industry. So there's, there's been a lot of accelerated increase uh, in alternative proteins for, for a lot of reasons. Um, and it's going beyond the vegan mafia. So, you know, as with a lot of emerging industries, uh, VC firms and angel investors make up the majority of the investors. And the most active of those are impact investors like New Crop Capital, Stray Dog Capital, and others. Um, but we're also seeing investors like Kleiner Perkins, Tomasek, Gold, you know, Goldman Sachs. We're seeing celebrities um, like Serena Williams and Leonardo DiCaprio. So there, there's, there's interest uh, all around. Yeah, Saloni, do you wanna maybe add to that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to put some things in perspective. Um, the, the investment and attention from impact investors, from celebrities is fantastic, I think. But still investment in plant-based and cultured meat uh, amounts to like less than 7% or less than 1%, I think, of the food tech industry and a fraction of the percent that's been invested in agricultural um, uh, tech. Um, and there's still, I think I was reading a GFI report, if, if we want to get to the level of market share that, let's say, plant-based milks have in the retail milk se uh, sector, which is about 14%, um, that represents about a $12 billion opportunity for plant-based meats if we want to reach the same level of market share in, in retail meats. So there's still a very, very large need. Um, and, and yes, cultivated meat has, has raised record-breaking amount of money in early 2020, but in the months since the pandemic, April and May, no U.S.-based, I believe, cell ag startups were awarded investment. Um, I think there are companies in Spain and Japan that were awarded investment. So the pandemic um, and the economic downturn has delayed funding rounds in some cases. And I, I worry about kind of years looking into the future, right? Some, some VCs may be advancing some of their funding to help protect the companies in their portfolio, but they may have reduced funding in later quarters and they may be less open to adding, especially newer startups to their portfolio. And the newer startups uh, represent um, where a lot of the innovation will be coming from. There's, there's a lack of, I think, attention to fermentation, for example, or alternative seafood. And a lot of those startups and companies are coming up. And there are even you know, plant-based and cultivated meat startups out there that, that may have the potential to disrupt the, the current big players that we have, like Impossible and Beyond, just as they had disrupted, um, I think, Tofurky and Boca Burgers and Morningstar Farms. So there's still a need for um, a large amount of investment. And you know, you also want it to come from government investment because they help to create a very innovative, uh, a very vibrant innovation ecosystem for, for the sector. Um, yeah. Well, Jason, like, so just to kind of, yeah, open it up and also be talking mm -hmm. about kind of the, the government uh, investment part. Do you have mm -hmm. thoughts on sort of how likely it is that, um, that we'll sort of get big government investment in, uh, in the plant-based meat sector. Um, and yeah, because you were talking about sort of grants earlier, which is different, but just sort of the idea of, of investment in general and coming from kind of the, 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 the federal government side, how likely do we think that is that that's going to happen, that they'll be, get enough funding? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts, Jason? I, you know, I don't have any real keen insights there. 
you know, is it likely there's going to be a very specific carve out for this particular kind of protein? I don't know, but I, I think it's likely that there are lots of the activities that plant-based or cultured-based products, they can fit within other categories, you know, whether, you know, if there were business troubles and shutdowns, there was funding through the CARES Act that, you know, sort of was available. Uh, and some of the other, you know, research-based funding that I mentioned before. Now, it might be more like, it might be likely that there there are some new programs in some of those areas um, that could be advocated for. What One thing I think I, I will say for broader context is um, there's a, a fair amount of research to suggest that the returns to research spending in agriculture are quite large. Like we significantly underinvest in agricultural research as it is. Uh, and I suspect that would be true of a lot of industries. This is just the one I happen to know. So I think even some of the most conservative estimates suggest there's like a, you know, 22 to one, you know, benefit for every dollar that's spent in agriculture. And a lot of that, you know, sort of how do you measure those benefits? A lot of it is, you know, greater productivity. So if we can use, you know, produce more using fewer resources. That's also related to sustainability and that, that makes food more affordable. And I, I suppose from my perspective, that's one of the things, you know, if we had more research funding available for plant-based, culture-based alternatives, it would be on that affordability question. Because that's the thing I think that really is impactful for consumers. And I think for these products to live up to their, um, you know, to their promise, they're going to need to come in at a, at a lower price point. If, if these products really use fewer resources, um, and they can get to economies of scale, they should come in at price points that are significantly lower than, than conventional, you know, animal-based products. They're not there yet. And, and I think, you know, I think one response to that is it's because there hasn't maybe been enough, you know, research invested or is there not enough scale? I think that's, that's very possible, but um, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not a political, you know, economist. I don't know the 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 likelihood of talking some politician into uh, proposing a, you know, something, you know, along these lines. It seems like even in our agricultural environment, it's been more possible to get some kinds of various subsidies to producers than it has been to advocate for research-based kind of funding, just due to the politics of it all. That's why I was yeah. sort of skeptical because I'd heard the same, mm -hmm. heard for years the same thing about agricultural research that yeah. it's already underfunded. Then maybe how are we going to get funding for um, the plant-based industry as well? Soleni, mm -hmm. did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think um, Jason, you brought a, a good point. It's it's hard to start new programs top down. Um, sometimes agencies might look for some specific type of wording or legislation, but certainly, as as the sector gains more interest, um, individual agencies, depending on how their program is structured will be, I think, open to uh, research proposals and projects related to alternative protein and to, and to speak a little bit to the benefits of um, agricultural productivity and increasing R&D. There's a huge climate benefit at a pretty low cost, I think. Uh, one of our uh, reports uh, that we talked about that investing in agricultural R&D, it's about an eight to thirteen dollar investment per ton uh, CO two saved. That's that's pretty low, um, I think. And uh, we one of our other estimates was kind of about uh, reducing the cost of uh, plant protein and what impact that would make. It turns out that halving the cost of plant proteins has a larger climate benefit and climate mitigation potential than maybe widely adopting some manure management technologies like anaerobic digesters, which the USDA provides funding for through their Rural Energy for America program. They invested $20 million um, in loans and grants in 2011. So I, I think that point can be used given that the climate benefit is so large um, and we're already investing in other uh, technologies that you know reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We should also be investing in all protein um, and it is very difficult, I, I know, in this political climate, but we can also work with state and municipalities and you can start there. You know, in California, alternative protein has such a big uh, presence. Um, why not talk to start by talking to Bay Area representatives and, and get something started at that level and then scale it out nationally. That's also another, um, I think, method. Great. If you don't mind, I'll just jump in as well. And I right. agree with everything that uh, Jason and Solani already said. Um, at the Good Food Institute, uh, government funding for alternative protein research is, is one of our top priorities, um, especially in 2020, for all the reasons already mentioned. Uh, we also think that public investment in research will stimulate economic growth, create jobs, including in rural communities. 
Um, and it will also have a lot of uh, public benefits. So in addition to, to climate change, we have benefits of food safety and security. Um, we also think that it's just as a country that we're going to fall behind if we don't invest in critical research now. Other countries like Israel and Singapore are already actively supporting the development of plant-based and cultivated meat industries. Um, and we think our economy will suffer if we don't do the same. And I think what we look, we, we look to, um, you know, the innovation like with smartphones, right? So just like in my Apple phone here, um, it may be branded Apple, but it's essentially a bundle of technologies that were developed using public resources. So government research enabled the development of not only the internet, but GPS, hard drives, and a lot of other technology. Um, and you know, if each company had developed those technologies itself and protected all of its discoveries under IP, uh, we might be still using flip phones. So, you know, there's a lot of foundational research that, that really still needs to be developed and made open access in order for all of the companies in the alternative protein sector to do well. Great. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, um, oh. Sorry, yeah. can I jump in? Yes, yes. I, I just wanted to add, it, add to um, Allison's point here on US leadership and R&D. Um, the USDA, and I wanna say this was maybe Oh, yeah, there's two grants, actually. So first, NASA's Small Business Innovation Research Grant, I believe, led to the development of the first cultivated meat burger. And I believe that grant was approved around 1990. So very, you know, well back in time. And the USDA also um, funded a research grant um, that led to the development of, I think it was high moisture extrusion technology, which was used by Beyond's product. So the U.S. was and is a key innovator and leader in the space, but we, like Allison said, are falling behind as the Netherlands, as all these other countries, Canada, um, puts out, you know, millions of dollars in investment in this sector. So uh, we, I think we have a responsibility to consumers and, and to people in our country and around the globe to invest as well. So I want to shift to questions. We have a lot of good ones. Um, the first one is, okay, recognizing that this is an emerging initiative, how much government hands-on oversight is required? Um, this kind of makes me think of cultured meat and the regulatory uh, environment for that. Um, I know, Allison, do you have thoughts on that yeah. since you guys have been so involved with that? Sure. So I'm not in our policy department, but I've been following their work very closely. And I think it's great news that the FDA and USDA jointly agreed last year um, to regulate the cultivated meat industry, with one of them overseeing the development of the cell line and then the other, um, the harvesting of the cells. So that's uh, really encouraging, right, for any, any companies that are hoping to sell in the United States. So, and we're working really to monitor what's happening internationally. You know, there are a lot of other company, uh, countries like um, Singapore, for example, that are also trying to move ahead as quickly as possible. Uh, we understand and, and really advocate for the fact that the process needs to be safe, right? We, we need to take our time and make sure that the oversight is in place um, and that companies are going to follow through um, in order for this industry to really be successful. And just so people know, because I did see a couple questions on this, that culture meat is actually meat kind of grown from cells. And um, so, because somebody asked a question about the texture of it, does it taste, I, I've had a cultured chicken nugget and it tastes like a chicken nugget. So whereas the plant-based meat is, you know, using kind of science to make those plants uh, taste like meat, but there's no uh, actual meat cells in it. Um, that's probably the worst explanation ever, but you know, there's Google if you, if you solve questions. <laughs> it's not like I write on these things at all. Uh, okay, so what, what is the next question here? Uh, what are the demographic, oh, that's a good question, uh, of alternative meat consumer? Uh, um, and Jason, you might have some insights on that. Urban versus rural, yeah. older folks, younger folks, uh, single people. <laughs> this came so up. we, you know, this, this is now a little dated, but about a year and a half ago, we did a study of U.S. consumers, a couple thousand U.S. consumers, and we had people do sort of a simulated grocery shopping ex experience and ask them to choose between a conventional beef patty versus, you know, we didn't call them this, but something that's like the impossible, something that's like the beyond, and something that's like, you know, the cultured meat. And, um, and on average, if prices are all the same, you get about oh, 75 to 80% of people choosing the conventional alternative, and then that remaining 20 to 30% choosing uh, 
choosing one of the alternatives. So, um, you know, so who are those people? And uh, in some ways, the best predictors are things that aren't surprising. Like if you're a vegetarian or vegan, you're a lot more likely to choose one of the alternatives. If you're younger, um, and, and tend to be, you know, slightly higher income. So they're associated with some of the same characteristics that we also associate with people that don't eat a lot of meat. But in general, like our models seem to suggest that um, one of the questions people might have is if you introduce a new alternative, um, you know, and it picks up market share, is it doing that by stealing market share away from say conventional animal based meat or is it adding new people who wouldn't have been in that category anyway? And the answer is it's a little bit of both. About half of the market share for the new alternatives according to our estimates are um, people switching from meat from you know animal based meat to one of these plant based alternatives and the other half are people that wouldn't have been buying a burger you know to begin with I think you're muted Jenny sorry everyone anyone else have any thoughts you want to add on that I can just I can just add um, that yeah we we see that the primary motivation by consumers at least in the U.S. is health and health can be a variety of things like I'm trying to lower my cholesterol or I'm trying to maintain my weight lose weight etc. Um, we do see other things like um, environmental sustainability and animal welfare as being concerns but they are absolutely lower on the list than than health and they tend to be um, they t you know I would say millennials young younger the younger generations will over index on environment and, and animal welfare. Mm -hmm. um, we absolutely think though that the, while vegans and vegetarians were the primary market for all of these products, um, it's really changed over the last couple of years because of one thing, which is the merchandising of these products. So where they used to be found in a part of the grocery store where only vegans or vegetarians you know, went to seek them out, now we're finding the Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger in the meat counter, right? Right next to animal burgers. Uh, and we're seeing that with some of the other products. Plant-based milk was the, was the real category that kind of drove this kind of merchandising um, about 20 years ago. And so we do think, you know, that that's now why we're seeing real, really all consumers like omnivores, flexitarians, vegans, vegetarians are all buying these products. And we think that that is going to increase. Allison, can I ask you a question about that health? Because we see the same in our surveys. Like just if you ask people word clouds, like what do you think about when you think about plant-based? Like health is one of the biggest things that comes up. Um, and the reason I want to, I'm just curious about your thoughts on it. Because if you look at, say, the macronutrients, number of calories, protein of, of a lot of these alternatives are not that different than conventional meat. So, you know, what, as you, as you indicated, maybe healthy means it just has a broad definition. Um, or... or or is the is the argument that these are are actually healthier just in terms of nutrient profile? What what do you yeah, think it, about it's, that? It's a, it's a great question and a sticky question. Um, I think if you look, I, I think the the way to answer this is is that the the benefits go beyond the nutrition, right? So so if you look at the life cycle analyses of some of these products, um, they are far better than their animal counterparts, using you know ninety percent less land, water, et cetera. Um, I do think on the on the health front, I think a lot of the companies making these products um, really had something to prove going out of the gate, which was, can we make a product that is truly on par from a full sensory perspective to the animal products they're replacing? And that was the first thing that they had to kind of meet. And I think a lot of them have actually shown that, yes, they can. Um, I think it's important to realize that those products are what I would call version 1.0 or 2.0. It's still really early. Um, I fully expect that these products are going to get healthier. They're going to figure out ways to have lower sodium, lower saturated fat, so that ultimately they will have a much healthier profile, cleaner label. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Not all the products are what you would call health food. There's a Good question here, just about um, kind of the, the, the politics of meat and uh, sort of the, the meatpacking plant closures and public reaction to that. And will that kind of have an impact on, on the plant-based industry? Will that drive more people to the plant-based industry? Um, I have some thoughts on that, but I'm skeptical of everything. So, so I'll just ask the question. <laughs> what, what do you, do you guys tell us, think? What, do, what don't you tell us your thoughts, Jenny? <laughs> 
I just know when I write an article that talks about sort of uh, animals being put down, that gets tons of attention. But if I talk about what's going on with people working in the plant, that gets a, little, a lot less attention. So I'm just not sure that many people, unfortunately, are that concerned about what what is going on with workers in these plants and and USDA inspectors? Can we just say too? Because that was that's also been a real big problem. Okay, I shared my thoughts, but um, uh, but uh, yeah. So I don't know. I, I mean, what what do you guys think? Do you think people are paying attention to these closures and kind of um, or even other just other sort of you know coverage of, of sort of the problems with meat lately? It doesn't even have to be that necessarily, but the um, the supply chains and stuff like that. Do you, do you, are you, do you think there's going to be a real public reaction to that that changes kind of what they buy at the, the grocery store? So I, I can say from the public interest, at least among media, um, you know, really during the, the worst of the plant closures, I mean, my, my, my phone was ringing off the hook for about, you know, two weeks solid from every major media outlet that you can think of. And I just say that to signal that people were interested, <laughs> you know, they, people were paying attention to this sector in a way that I've never seen in my career. Yeah. Um, now, does that translate into people's changes in people's buying habits and buying behavior? That's a much trickier question. We're, we're not seeing that yet in any of the, the sort of tracking surveys that we do. But yes, people were certainly very interested. I, I think in the, you know, my sense though is the it was really more of a critique about the concentrated nature of our, you know, meatpacking sector than anything else. And it, it may provide some political motivations to, to do some things to change that structure more than a critique of animal agriculture per se it would be my interpretation of, of the sort of typical consumer's attitude. And they wanted to know that meat was going to be in the freezer, right? Like, oh, well, yeah, that was the number one question is, are we going to run out? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Not to be cynical, but <laughs> I'm cynical. Saloni, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think two things here. I think with the outbreak of COVID-19, it being a zoonotic uh, disease, people started to sort of associate um, disease and concentrated livestock operations together. It's a very, very complex relationship and very uh, complicated field of study. But I think people started, like you said, Jason, to be concerned about, uh, concerned about that. And as far as how impactful um, news, news about it, you know, workers getting impacted, um, to me, I'm a little skeptical about how that will change people's the dietary uh, choices because these problems have been around. They've been just exposed and uh, even more, and, and it's been showing how vulnerable the food system is, but maybe a little skeptical, but at the end of the day, people will be kind of thinking about the products that they're consuming and, and whether or not um, how they kind of stack up in terms of taste and price and, and health, as you said, at the end of the day. But will they think twice? Maybe, and maybe that'll impact some people's decisions, but hard to say. One thing I might want to push back just a little bit on is, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there's there's zoonotic zoonotic diseases that can transfer from animals to humans, but you know, in this case, if anything, it was probably a wild animal. And I happen to live in an area country with a lot of hog operations. These are basically biosecure facilities. You can't go into a hog farm because they don't want diseases being spread. So to the you know to the extent there are concerns about you know you know jumping of diseases from animals to humans, it seems like the there may there are a lot of things you can say that you don't like about so-called factory farms. I don't I don't think that's one of them. Um, in my opinion, I, I think the issue is more about how people feel about, say, the animal welfare in those you know conditions, or th the stories that Jenny was talking about about you know possible euthanasia. That's the thing that uh, captured mm -hmm. people's attention in in my assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, one other question I want to pop in here with. Have you, any of you explored whether the development of cultured meat would be faster or slower if the key technologies were open source rather than corporate IP? That is a very good question. Yeah. Um, I, so, I mean, you know, there, there, are, there are still a lot of challenges that need to be overcome for a cultivated meat to eventually come to market. And, you know, we look at it in four different categories, which is the cell line development, 
cell culture media, bioreactors, and then the scaffolding material, which will give it a 3D structure. And I think the cell culture media is, is definitely an area where if, if there was some kind of an open source development, it could really benefit the whole industry. Um, you know, it, it, it basically, cell culture media is really just a combination of amino acids and sugars and salts, but it also contains growth factors and, and those are, are what tend to be very expensive. Um, so from our perspective, if there was, you know, more government research um, into this that, that could help really with all of this, especially with the cell culture media, it would enable the industry to move forward a lot quicker. At the same time, uh, nothing like the possibility of making millions, billions of dollars if you can be the person to develop that uh, growth media, right? <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of economic incentive to try to get it, even in private industry. But you're right. I mean, it's obviously if you can get if you can get something developed out of the public sector that can be broadly applied, then then there's also large benefits there too. And, and it reduces. One, oh. um, well, just actually one last question that I'll throw in here because it kind of ties to what we're talking about. Um, that you know, at this point, culture be, being where it is, what? Sorry, should we just uh, either should we throw more money into that, like as a strategy now? You know, is it does it make more sense to maybe like hoard all our uh, money, get the vegan mafia all going into uh, the vegan mafia investors going into cultured meat just to like speed that forward because maybe that will be more impactful or should we just say, uh, forget it culture meat, let's just go all to, into plant-based since it's already on the market, it's already established, uh, people are already starting to get to know it. So what, what do we think about kind of the balance of those two? We don't think it should be either or. It, it should be actually all three. And, and we haven't talked about the third, which is fermentation, which is an enabling technology for both producing biomass like corn, Q-U-O-R-N, uh, or uh, using precision fermentation to make ingredients, which will make plant-based or cultivated uh, products taste better. So, you know, we, we really see that um, all three of those sectors uh, have room in this whole economy. I mean, it's a very, very large market and, you know, we think consumers are, are going to be looking for all three of them. So I would advise the vegan mafia to put their money in all three of those camps. So Lone, I didn't mean to cut you off before. Sorry, did you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I totally agree with with Allison here, especially in terms of fermentation um, that may actually drive help drive down the costs of cell culture media for cultivated meat. So it's it's very important technology. And on the plant based side, there, there's still room for um, research and characterizing crops and, in, you know, optimizing ingredients and um, fermentation can actually help increase the uh, protein content of some of the plants as well. So there's there's a lot of room actually on, on all three sides for development um, and, and foundational questions on all three. Well, I'll, I'll agree with my uh, colleagues here that, you know, there's a old investment saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So one key is diversification and that's true on technologies too. We don't, sometimes you don't know which technology is gonna produce the biggest breakthrough or hit. Um, and the other one is the, the sort of trade off between um, short-term versus longer-term payoffs, you know, and, and we have plant-based alternatives in the market now. So the, the potential of you re recouping your investment sooner rather than later, it, that's probably your opportunity. Whereas some of the culture products might be a little longer term investment, but, but maybe higher, you know, it's, there's all risks involved. Great. Thank you. Uh, my, my screen was freezing up there for a second, but it seems to just be stable so I can close this hopefully and everyone can still hear me. <laughs> for my internet just shuts me out for the rest of the world. Um, thank you everybody. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Um, um, I'm on Twitter all the time <laughs> when I'm not parenting or working. So just, just tweet me uh, and you can find the rest of us on, on Twitter, I think all of us. Um, and I think we're gonna try to export the questions so we can try to answer them as well. Um, but thank you to all my panelists. This was so fascinating. Um, and thanks to everybody who stuck with us for this conversation. And thanks to the Breakthrough Institute for having us.